Hello, greetings. This is a video. It is about stress on an inclined plane of a rectangular bar subjected to axial compression. So let's see what we have here. Our bar is 10 millimeters by 20 millimeters by 100 millimeters. And we know that the length is going to be the 100 millimeters. That's actually not going to affect our work on this problem at all, but that would be the 100. How do I know that for sure? Well, this little call out is telling me the cross-sectional dimensions. And there's another clue here. So it's kind of shown in triplicate. But basically, our cross-section is a 10 by 20. And we got a 100 millimeter length, so a fairly small little bar. We are loading it in 10 kilonewtons of axial compression. Arrows pointed toward the body is compression, and we are in static equilibrium. We want to know what's happening at inclined planes AA and BB. Okay, so there is AA, there is BB. Both of the planes are oriented at 70 degrees as shown. So we start our work on this problem as we do almost every problem. And what we would like to do is create a free body diagram. The tool that I want, I'm going to use this one. Okay, now I'm ready. Sorry about that. I'm going to grab right here. I'm going to cut at plane AA. I'm going to choose to take the left side of the free body. Edit, copy, merge, edit, paste. And we will put that right about here. Okay, so we'll do this free body first and then we'll do free body through plane BB and I'm going to go ahead and cut that now and then we'll draw on it a little bit later so cut through the solid material every time we cut through the solid material we are exposing the internal forces and moments Okay, make this approximately the same size. That looks good. And we'll put it right over here. Excellent, excellent. Okay, there is kind of a little procedure that I'd like for you to follow as you work on number one, putting these free bodies in equilibrium. And then number two, breaking the forces down into the transformed coordinate system. Let me explain what I mean. For this first free body on the left, the idea behind this problem is to take stresses in the xy coordinate system or forces in the xy coordinate system. And we would like to transform them to the x prime y prime coordinate system really and all we're doing is rotating about z just like that to grow to go from our input xy to our output or destination or local lots of words is this to to explain that x prime y prime okay so for now i'm just going to let these kind of hover here Here's the procedure. I've taught this course long enough to know that what I'm about to do seems completely intuitive, easy, peasy, logical when I do it. But when students try to duplicate it on their own, there are many, many, many ways to make a mistake. So listen carefully. Put a little dot there at the centroid of cut plane AA. I need to put my free body in equilibrium. So let's push a 10 kilonewton force in the negative x direction for global equilibrium. Now my free body is now in equilibrium. I could stop there. But that's not going to help me make progress on the solution. To make progress on the solution, here is what I need to do. I need to construct, first of all, my global input x-axis is going to run you know, left to right, just like this little picture shows. And I'm going to use the right 
I'm sorry, before I do the right hand rule, I'm going to construct, this is important, x prime by definition outer normal to the cut plane. Okay, so my cut plane, I need an, I want to do a vector that's going to define the direction of x prime. It is the outward facing normal direction to the cut plane. Okay, so we'll compare and contrast what we're doing now with plane BB, which we'll pursue here in a few minutes. Okay, now why we're going to use the right hand rule to determine the location of Y prime. Does it run up the plane or down the plane? And the answer is it goes up the plane like this. So now we've got our X prime and Y prime in the picture. Okay, here is the next step we would like to construct a bounding box that is within the x prime y prime coordinate system that bounds that vector just like this so notice that i'm doing two lines one parallel to x prime, one parallel to y prime. I'm doing that because I need to break this vector into its components that are perpendicular and parallel to the cut plane AA. Okay. Now I'm going to do a little trick here because I can. I'm just going to rotate my screen. Watch this. I'm rotating the whole drawing. See how the text up at the top is rotating? Excuse me, didn't get to the mute in time to muffle my cough. Sorry about that. So I'm just turning my paper. And when I explain this in class, a lot of times I talk about rotating my head. You can also rotate your paper. And the idea is, you know, you want this coordinate system. You want this. Oh, I can't do that, can I? All right, there's a way around everything. I would like this coordinate system in this XY plane right here. Okay, I want that to kind of feel natural. So whether you do that by rotating your paper, rotate your head, um, either one of those is an effective technique, right? And at this point in the process, all we're doing is breaking down a force vector into its components like we have so many times before. Now, the one thing to remember here, so this is a common error you want both of the forces that you construct in the x prime y prime coordinate system they must go through that centroid of the cut plane so the bottom component of that 10 kilonewton force there it is right there that is normal to the cut plane so i'm going to call that in the one that is in plane or parallel, there it is right there. I'm going to call that V. At this point in the process, you have to memorize the following relationship. Theta is defined as the rotation from X to X prime. So we're rotating our coordinate system theta. We're rotating about z. So you could use a z for a subscript if you would like to. In a 2D problem such as this, that subscript is not commonly used, so I will leave it off mine. And if I zoom in a little closer, I can take that same rotation and I'm going to draw it in a place 
where it is perhaps a little more useful to us, which is right there. Okay. At this point, I'm going to, let's see, do I want to change my worldview? Maybe not quite, not quite. So let's look at some of the ge uh, geometric information that was given in the problem, namely this 70 degree angle right there. Okay, so we can find that right down here in context. I'm going to put another layer here because I want to show you kind of what I do in terms of my spatial gymnastics on this. Okay, so I find this little right triangle right here. Oop. And the given information in the problem tells me that this angle is 70 degrees. I'm going to see if I can do this in this program. Let me think for just a second. So if I want to flip my layer, flip my layer vertically, let's see if this did what I wanted it to do. It did. OK. So basically, I'm just taking that triangle. And if I had drawn this a little bit kind of better to scale, <laughs> it would fit in here a little nicer. I can tweak it, of course, to make it fit. But I'm doing this spatial analysis to find that 70 degree angle in my triangle. Now, the 70 is all inside out and backwards in mirror images, but it's up here at the top. I'm going to take that layer and tune it way, way, way down, add another one, and put that 70 degrees where I want it, which is here. Okay, we know, of course, theta is going to be um, 90 minus 70, so that's going to be 20 degrees. And that theta does have a sign, and our sign convention says that a clockwise rotation like this we define that as a negative angle. So if you wanted to report this, you'd have to say theta is equal to negative 20 degrees or 20 degrees clockwise or 20 degrees, draw the little clockwise arrow, any of those would be okay um, in order to report what that rotation actually is. Okay, I know I'm going kind of slow, so I appreciate your patience. I want to make sure you get this. And I've taught it long enough to know that there are a million ways to make silly little errors on these types of problems. Let's write this out. So the hypotenuse of the triangle, that was my 10 kilonewton force. My normal force to plane AA is going to be 10 kilonewtons multiplied by the cosine of 20 degrees. And in order to deduce that, I'm just using this triangle. I'll do one more layer, one more layer. So I've got this triangle. There is my right angle. There is 20 degrees. There is N. There is 10 kilonewtons. I'll just move it over here. Shrink it down a little bit. So I'm going to use my cosine identity. So the cosine of an angle, cosine of angle theta is equal to the adjacent leg over the hypotenuse. And the adjacent leg in our case is in the bottom of our triangle. The hypotenuse is 10 kilonewtons. So when I rearrange that simple equation to solve for 
the normal force in, I get 10 kilonewtons times cosine of 20 degrees like that. course we can do a very similar analysis uh, to get the vertical component so see this vertical leg here all right that's my vector v and of course we see it in context it has to be located right here coincident with the centroid and i'll explain why that is here in a minute but for now just kind of go with it um, and it is opposite to the 20 degrees. So we can use a sine identity, sine 20 degrees equals opposite over hypotenuse. That's equal to the shear force V over the hypotenuse of 10 kilonewtons. Rearrange that and you will get shear force V equals 10 kilonewtons times sine of 20 degrees. And of course, the sine of 20 degrees is equal to the cosine of 70 degrees. So if that method makes sense to you, go for it, do that. All right, I'm going to get rid of that one and come back to this one. Go back to my pretty purple color and just add this into the mix. 10 kilonewtons times sine of 20 degrees. Okay, remember, we're at this funky angle. So I'm going to put my paper back the way that kind of our original worldview was. And I want to make sure you understand why these two vectors, V and N, are coincident to the centroid of cut plane AA. At this point in the process, by the way, you could kind of remove this. You don't need it anymore. It just kind of gets in the way. So the, the system of vectors V and N is equivalent to that P vector that I just hid underneath the yellow cloud. Um, but the reason why all of these um, need to be aligned to the centroid is because if they were not aligned there, we would have a rotation and net moment on this free body. We need the free body to stay in equilibrium. And this system of vectors, one, two, and three, all three of the lines of actions of those three vectors go right through that point. So we know there is no tendency to rotate. Excuse me. There is no um, moment. And we have a nice system that is in static equilibrium. All right, I'm going to do the same thing for the other free body, but I will pick up the pace just a little bit. And I think what I would like to do is this. Let's see. I think I'm going to just grab all of this stuff. Not with that tool, but with this one. Let's grab all this stuff, cut it, and paste it. That'll put it on a new layer. And then I can get rid of that one. Get all, rid of all these temporarily. I think I'm going to get rid of this blue one permanently. I think it's served its purpose. And get rid of layer four. OK. We'll do the same thing on the other one. Let's pick up the pace a little bit, but remember the steps. This is where the majority of the errors happen. I'm going to put a dot at the centroid of the cut plane. I'm going to note my global or input coordinate system x, y. I want to construct x prime such that it is outward normal such that it is outward normal to this plane okay normal means perpendicular outward means pointing away um, i'll do this in uh, blue is fine Whoosh. that is x prime by definition now listen in these four lectures, we're starting with kind of manual techniques. We, we, we will be building 
towards using equations that will make this work easier. Your use of the equations is contingent on your mastery of the little details, like having this x prime axis go in the correct direction. Now we've got to figure out y prime. We're using the right hand rule. Here's what I'm going to do. See this little y x right there? I'm just going to start rotating it. I want to move x to x prime. I'll make it a little bigger so we can see it clearly. This is all temporary. Stick it right there. And rotate around. There we go. Put it right there. If x prime is the outward normal, using the right hand rule, y prime is running down the plane. Put it back over there where it belongs. All right, so I go down here, and that is going to define where x, I'm sorry, y prime is going this way. Theta measures from x to x prime. So what would theta be if I was at, if you were asked to calculate that? Start here, go all the way around to there. That is your theta from x, y to x prime, y prime. Little details, but super duper important. All right, I'm going to take that off my picture for now. Cool. Now we do the thing where we rotate the paper or our head. Actually, before we do that, I'll leave it at this orientation. The next thing is to put it in static equilibrium. So we have a net force here that we need to counteract. So let's put this one. right back here. I'll draw it nice and large, oversize it so we can really see it. Okay, so that's our 10 kilonewton force. Now watch carefully, I get my little ruler. I want to take a line, I'm creating that bounding box. This is a step that causes a lot of problems. See how I'm making it parallel to x prime? pretty parallel anyway. And I offset it over here to grab the tail end of that vector. Do the same thing. So the next one I align to y prime. Offset it. Now I've got a bounding box in x prime, y prime, and I want to break the 10 kilonewton vector down into its components. All right, now I'm going to turn my head or turn the paper until my worldview is no longer x, y, but x prime, y prime. And I could go all the way around if I wanted to. If you want to see it this way with x prime, go into the right. Why not? Just turn your head, turn your paper. We need to break that vector down into its two components. They need to live in the plane of the cross section. Okay, so my shear vector is there and my normal vector is this one. Get their directions correct so that the sum of those two vectors. And um, I'm, I'm kind of torn about trying to write upside down. Um, I'm going to write the whole thing in a word. And that way, when I rotate it around, even though it'll be upside down and all messed up, we can still kind of remember what it was that we were actually doing. Okay. Now we've got to find our triangles again. This is the way that I would do it. You grab a new layer. I would grab that triangle right there. There is the right triangle. There is the 70 degrees that's given to me in the problem. Okay. 
The other end, of course, is uh, 90 minus 70 or 20 degrees. I'm going to do an a image flip layer vertically. So I just flipped it. So kind of mirror imaged it. See how I mirror imaged it? And then we rotate it. This one, I think I did a better job of sketching than the last. So we're lining up these two similar triangles to find the 20 degrees versus the 70 degrees. Okay. Do that little piece of mental gymnastics. Now we know that the 20 degrees is here. There is a right angle. Of course, 70 degrees is here. Yeah, we could do the same thing for the other right triangle if we're so inclined to do so. All right, I'm going to rotate my picture back around so we can look at this right side up. Let's see, something like that. Crazy, right? Okay, now we're back to our original worldview. Let's figure out these vectors. So my normal vector n is equal to 10 kilonewtons cosine of 20 degrees. Same we got on the other side. Hopefully that makes sense to you. And my shear force v is equal to 10 kilonewtons times sine of 20 degrees. All right, in order to answer the problem, so both of these planes, AA and BB, they're oriented at 70 degrees. So I could use either free body for the last part of the problem. We want to determine what is the stress on that plane. So far, we have focused on the forces. And thank you for your patience. I know I'm doing this crazy amount of detail, excruciatingly slow. Um, I hope it is useful to you. Stresses are the, the easy part. So our stresses that are uh, normal to plane BB, we just get the normal force divided by the area of that inclined plane. And for the shearing stresses that are parallel or in plane, we just do the shearing force over the area of that plane. So we just need one other step, which is determine the area of the plane. There are uh, two ways to do this. Here's the way that we did in lecture. Pop on another layer. I'm going to grab this triangle, come straight down, over, up. Color that yellow because I can. Why not, right? If you can color something yellow, color something yellow. And then there is that 70 degree angle there. And the height of this bar we know is 20. So this distance from top fiber to bottom fiber is 20 millimeters. Pull that over to the side. We need the length of this hypotenuse here. I'm going to call that throwaway symbol L. And here we're going to want to use, I've got my 70 degrees here. So you could use either the 20 degree or the 70 degree. I'll just stick with the 70 degree because that's the one on the picture. And since I know the measurement 20 millimeters, that is um, opposite to 70 degrees. I'm going to use the sine identity. So sine of 70 degrees is equal to opposite 20 millimeters divided by hypotenuse L. And so we can write an expression for L 20 millimeters divided by sine 70 degrees. And of course, it is completely OK. The one I did in class will look more like this 20 millimeters divided by cosine of 20 degrees because that number and that number are exactly the same thing. In order to get the area of the plane, what I need to do is take that length L and then extrude it into the page 10 millimeters because that is the width of the bar. Okay, so the area of plane BB is going to be equal to this times 10. That means up top 20 times 10 is 200 
millimeters squared divided by cosine of 20 degrees. Okay, so that's the long way to come up with the area of that plane. The much faster way is just to know through projections, vector projections, and dot products that if this is the cross-sectional area and you want to get the projected area on a plane that is 20 degrees apart, you just take the cross-sectional area and divide by cosine theta, in our case, 20 degrees. All right, at this point, we are ready to get back into business here. So let's plug into sigma, my normal force. Look at our picture to that plane. So we have 10 E3 Newtons. Do a little unit conversion in the front to make your job at the end a little easier, multiplied by cosine 20 degrees. Down in the denominator, we want the area of the plane. We just calculated that to be 200 millimeters squared. And that other cosine 20, I'll toss up in the numerator. That means that term becomes squared. And um, multiply all of that out. I've got this here on my nodes. Da -da 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 -da. That should be 44.2 megapascals. And since we're reporting stresses at this point, it's best to either use a C for compression or just use our negative sign to show that compression. I'm going to copy this down so I can get that other layer out of the way and then we'll do our final calculation and be done with this one. Okay. All right, so this is looking great. We've got our normal stress done. Um, let's go on to our shear stress, our final calculation. Shear stress equals shear force. There it is there. 10 E3 Newtons times sine 20 degrees divided by the area of the plane. That's 200 millimeters squared divided by cosine 20. So I'll toss it into the numerator. And that will be to three sig figs, 16.1 megapascals. Also there, so this one has a definite sign of, of compression versus tension for my normal stress. So, you know, try to communicate that in your answer. Our shearing stresses, we know that we tend to communicate those by only using the magnitude and then we'll sketch the direction on a stress element. We won't do that on this particular example problem, but we'll do one on a future one coming up. Stay tuned for the exciting continuation of stress on an inclined plane. Thanks for tuning in.